everyone, and welcome to AAR's Fiscal 2025 First Quarter Earnings Call. We're joined today by John Holmes, Chairman, President, and Chief Executive Officer, and Sean Gillen, Chief Financial Officer. Before we begin, I'd like to remind you that the comments made during the call may include forward-looking statements as defined in the Private Security Litigation Reform Act of 1995. These forward-looking statements involve risks and uncertainties that could cause actual results to differ materially from the forward-looking statements. Accordingly, these statements are no guarantee of future performance. These risks and uncertainties are discussed in the company's earnings release and the risk factor section of the company's annual report on Form 10-K for the fiscal year ended at May 31, 2024. In providing, in providing the forward-looking statements, the company assumes no obligation to provide updates to reflect future circumstances or anticipated or unanticipated events. Certain non-GAAP financial information will be discussed in the call today. A reconciliation of these non-GAAP measures to the most comparable GAAP measures is set forth in the company's earnings release. A replay of this conference call will be available for on-demand listening shortly after the completion of the call on AAR's website. At this time, I would like to turn the call over to AAR's Chairman, President, and CEO, John Holmes. Great. Thank you. And thank you to everyone for joining us this afternoon to discuss our most recent quarter's results. We are very proud of the performance we delivered during our first quarter of fiscal 2025. This was a very solid start to the year, and I'm grateful to our team for continuing to deliver. AAR advanced strategic initiatives and continued to execute well across the company. We are benefiting from structural tailwinds, elevated levels of air travel, and an aging fleet which drives demand for our aftermarket services. Our company is more focused than ever within our three main operating segments, hard supply, repair and engineering, and integrated solutions. We are making investments in each of these three segments to drive growth, improve our efficiency, and deliver higher margins. You saw that this quarter, and we expect the benefit from these investments to continue throughout our fiscal 2025. With that, I will turn to our first quarter results. We delivered quarterly sales of $662 million, up 20% year over year, driven by growth in each of our segments. Additionally, we had growth in both our commercial and government businesses, with each growing at 20%. Our distribution and hangar activities had particularly strong performance, and our recent acquisitions of tracks and product support were also meaningful contributors this quarter. Regarding profitability, I am pleased that once again we demonstrated significant operating margin expansion. Our adjusted operating margins increased by 180 basis points year over year from 7.3% to 9.1%. This was the result of the continued organic margin expansion as well as contribution from the tracks and product support acquisitions. I'm now going to go into these results in a little more detail for each of our three main segments. Heart supply is our largest and most profitable segment and where we have very significant opportunity for organic growth. This segment contains two activities, U-Parts Distribution and Youth Serviceable Material, or USM. Distribution represents nearly 60% of parts supply and 22% of consolidated sales. USM represents approximately 40% of parts supply and 15% of consolidated sales. In U-Parts Distribution, sales grew 26% organically driven by continued market share gains. We benefited from both continued commercial demand strength and recovery in our government volumes. We're the largest independent distributor of OEM parts, and our independent status is a key strategic advantage which eliminates conflicts and allows our OEM partners to serve all aircraft types. This is a key driver behind our consistent market share gains, and we believe we have a long run one way ahead of us as we have a strong pipeline of opportunities. For the USM activity within part supply, we saw a decline in year-over-year -year sales driven entirely by the lack of whole assets, predominantly engines, available in the market. The decrease in whole assets sales is a result of the current dynamics in the aviation aftermarket, the continued delay of new aircraft deliveries, ongoing challenges with new engine platforms have resulted in a greater use of the existing fleet, which has resulted in lower retirements. While overall, this is good for AAR, in USM specifically, it means that there is less supply available. We do anticipate more aircraft retirements over time, which will increase the supply of USM to service that demand. Turning to repair and engineering, sales growth was 58% in the quarter. Excluding the product support acquisition, sales growth was 6% as we continue to see strong underlying demand for our MRO services. Even though our hangars are largely at capacity, 
We continue to grow inside of our existing footprint with both increased efficiency and improved throughput. That said, our hangar capacity expansions in Miami and Oklahoma City remain on track for operation beginning in the second half of calendar 2025. As a reminder, these expansions will add approximately $60 million of annual sales. Regarding the Triumph product support acquisition, the business has exceeded our initial expectations in the first two quarters, and we are in the early stages of unlocking significant additional value. In terms of cost synergy, we are on track to achieve the previously announced target of $10 million and are confident we will exceed this number once the complete consolidation of our once we complete the consolidation of our existing Long Island facility into the facilities in Grand Prairie, Texas and Wellington, Kansas. Additionally, we continue to make progress on in-sourcing repair work in support of our commercial programs and USM activities. Turning to integrated solutions, in the quarter we drove growth across both our commercial and government offerings, which resulted in total sales growth of 8% for this segment. Tracks had a particularly strong quarter with some significant new business wins and customer implementations. Customer interest in Tracks' offering remains strong, and we are excited about the potential to continue to win market share with new customers and expand our services with existing customers. Our government program activities and integrated solutions had a strong quarter as well. Subsequent to the quarter, we had two significant business wins in government programs. We were awarded a five-year, firm fixed-price IDIQ contract with the Navy to perform air frame maintenance on their P-8 fleet. This award is a continuation of existing work. We also won a new contract to support the engine maintenance for the Navy on the same P-8 aircraft fleet. These wins demonstrate the significant value proposition that AAR brings to its government customers. Overall, I'm incredibly proud of the quarter that we just delivered, and with that, I'll turn it over to Sean. Thanks, John. <clears throat> Total sales in the quarter grew 20% to $662 million. Excluding the impact from the recently acquired product support business, organic sales growth for the quarter was 6%. Commercial sales increased 20% with growth in all three of our core segments. Our commercial distribution sales were a particular standout as we continued to drive sales growth on existing product lines and expanded newly won product lines as well. Government sales also increased 20%, an improvement from the 15% growth we experienced in the fourth quarter. The sales increase was driven by an ongoing recovery across our government program activities and increased order volume for our new parts distribution activities. Adjusted operating profit margin improved 180 basis points from 7.3% to 9.1%. Adjusted EBITDA margin increased 180 basis points from 9.5% to 11.3%. We have a clear roadmap for continued margin improvements over the medium term as our mix shifts towards our higher margin segments and we realize synergies in the recently acquired product support business. We continue to roll out our airframe maintenance efficiency improvement initiatives and expect further margin improvements as capacity expansion projects come online. Net interest expense for the quarter was $18.3 million, reflecting the financing of the product support acquisition, and we expect Q2 interest expense to be approximately the same as Q1. Average diluted share count in the quarter was 35.6 million shares. For FY25, we continue to expect our effective tax rate to be approximately 28%. Adjusted diluted EPS increased from $0.78 cents to $0.85, cents, reflecting the benefit of our growth and margin expansion. The product support acquisition was accretive to earnings for the quarter, which we expect to continue through FY25. With that, I'll turn to the detailed results by segment. Part supply sales grew 5% to $250 million, driven by 26% growth in distribution and a 22% decline in USM. We once again drove double-digit growth in distribution as we continue to gain market share. Growth in the quarter was positively impacted by the expansion of both existing product lines and the ramp up of new business wins, as well as greater purchases by both the U.S. and foreign governments. Our USM activities were down due to lack of availability of whole assets. Part supply adjusted operating margins increased by 110 basis points to 12.1% in the quarter, driven by distribution, which benefited from scale and mix. The improvement of distribution, of distribution sales to government customers also contributed to the increase in margins. Repair and engineering sales increased 58% to $218 million. On an organic basis, sales increased 6%. 
Demand remains strong for our heavy maintenance and component repair capabilities, and we look to continue to drive growth in these activities. Repair and engineering adjusted operating margins increased by 460 basis points to 11.2% in the quarter, driven by the inorganic impact of product support and continued efficiency gains in the hangars. Going forward, we expect to drive further margin expansion in this segment from the realization of product support synergies, rollout of our paperless hangar initiatives, and the capacity expansions once they come online in FY26. Integrated solution sales increased 8% to 169 million, driven by growth in commercial power by the hour activities, certain government programs, and from tracks. Integrated solutions adjusted operating margin decreased by 40 basis points to 6.2% in the quarter, based on the mix within government programs. In expeditionary services, our government customer has decided to revert to the current generation pallets and as a result, terminated our contract to provide next generation pallets. We are the incumbent on the current generation pallets and will continue to support the government demand for these products as we await a potential new RFP for the next generation pallet. We do not expect any material change in the outlook for expeditionary services due to the government's decision. However, related to the termination, in the quarter we recognized revenue of $9.5 million and a net loss of $3.2 million, which are excluded from our adjusted results. Turning to consolidated cash, cash flow used in operating activities was $19 million in the quarter as we made investments in the business, particularly in inventory to support the growth in distribution. Despite this cash use, we maintained net leverage of 3.3 times net debt to adjusted pro forma EBITDA. For the balance of the fiscal year, we expect to reduce net leverage through both growth in EBITDA as well as reduction in net debt. Our balance sheet and capital structure afford us sufficient flexibility to manage our business and make decisions that maximize shareholder value. With that, I will turn the call back over to John. Great. Thank you, Sean. I'm very pleased with the results that we delivered in Q1 and the strong start to our fiscal year. Demand for our services remains exceptionally strong, and the current dynamics in the aviation supply chain overall are in our favor. Looking to Q2 of fiscal 2025 specifically, we expect sales growth of 18 to 22 percent and adjusted operating margins similar to Q1, which was 9.1 percent. We continue to make tremendous progress towards executing our long-term objectives. We continue to gain market share and distribution, are on track with capacity expansions and repair and engineering, are growing the track software offering, and driving higher margins through investments in efficiency and differentiated capabilities. We are exceptionally well positioned to capitalize on the strength that we are seeing in our markets and I'm very excited about our future. With that, I'll turn it over to the operator for questions. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, to ask the question, please press star 11 on your telephone and then wait to hear your name to be announced. To withdraw your question, please press star 11 again. Please stand by while we compile the Q&A roster. Our first question comes from the line of Scott Micas with Melius Research. Your line is open. Hi, John, Sean. Good evening. Hey, how are you? Uh, John, I wanted to ask on the Triumph product support asset. So it came with 6,000 proprietary DER repairs. So I'm just wondering, how should we think about the growth and the number of DER repairs that you can do? Are you going to add to that? So should I be thinking an annual growth rate on that or just a simple number of repairs you want to add per annum? Uh, a great question and an important uh, asset that came with uh, – um, that came with the acquisition. What I would say there is rather than trying to quantify the types of repairs, I would say that the, the majority of the 6,000 DER repairs that Triumph has are focused on structures. And we are focused on um, broadening that DER repair capability to the accessories and components that are repaired in, uh, in the other uh, areas of Triumph, of TPS. Um, and so again, rather than trying to quantify you know, a growth rate or number of repairs, I would say that from a, a product type we would look to, to, to capture the opportunity beyond what they've done in the structures world. Okay, got it. And then I also want to stick with repair and engineering and just thinking about the MRO hangar. So you have the capacity expansions in Oklahoma City and Miami that will be ready for the fall of 2025. But I'm just wondering, do you have the pipeline of workers to fill those hangars on day one, or is it going to take time to train, hire, and ramp up those new employees to generate sales and profits? Yeah, uh, great question. Um, you know, we're very excited about that capacity coming online. We're, we're also excited that it's sold. 
um, uh, and we, we went into markets where we knew we would have a long-term base load customer, and we knew, to your point, that we would be able to, um, uh, to, hire, to hire up. So both Miami and Oklahoma City are favorable labor markets for us. We've had a long-time presence in each place. Um, we've got relationships with local uh, uh, providers and schools, et cetera. And so we feel really good about our ability to, to recruit talent in both locations. Um, there will be a ramp up in each facility. Um, there always is. There's a, a, just a bit of an operational curve, though. But we feel very confident in, uh, in a relatively short ramp up and our ability to, to hire the labor to support uh, that new business. All right. Thanks for taking the questions. Thank you. Please stand by for our next question. Our next question comes from the line of Michael Chamoli with True Securities. Your line is open. Hey, uh, good evening, guys. Thanks for taking the questions. Uh, nice results. Um, hey, John, just on the, the USM and, and kind of the, the challenges there, I mean, how are you guys thinking about um, or, or how are you potentially forecasting whole asset sales for the year? I, I've got to imagine that's a challenge. And, and does that market, I mean, just given what's going on with the Boeing strike, I mean, obviously hard to tell how long it lasts, but presumably airlines aren't getting planes they needed. Does, does that market potentially get even tighter for you? Yeah, so uh, great question. You know, first of all, I would say that uh, despite the decline that we saw in the U.S. In business, we are really happy that the rest of the company performed really, really well, and we were able to deliver 20% um, growth in the quarter. And um, that's one of the reasons we call out, you know, USM is 15% of our business. And um, uh, to your point, yes, anything that, um, uh, you know, puts more pressure on the existing fleet like the Boeing strike is going to extend the tightness in the USM market, but more importantly, it's going to extend the robust demand that we see for the other, you know, 80 plus percent of uh, of the company. Um, so we, uh, you know, it, it it is a difficult thing to uh, to forecast, um, and and we do expect that you know at some point as these aircraft are retired and disassembled, it will result in more asset availability. And that will occur while there is still strong demand for these assets, and we're in the right position to uh, uh, to capture that. But you know, right now the 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 overall tailwinds and dynamics um, that that you described or that we're seeing in the market are benefiting uh, uh, the, the the overall company as a whole. Got it. Is, is there any way to parse out maybe the the piece part or component sales of USM versus you know the headwind that that kind of uh, or maybe yeah. the underlying growth that was masked by the whole asset sales? Yeah, yeah. what I would say is that uh, uh, the fourth quarter for individual piece parts sales was the, the highest quarter we've ever had in individual parts sales in USM. Uh, the quarter we just ended was the second highest we've ever seen. So okay. the individual parts sales there are, um, uh, are, are, are very strong, and we are able to locate that material. It's the whole assets right now that are, uh, that are constrained. The only other thing I would yeah. add there is, you know, that, that market is very situational, right? I mean, you can see, a, you know, like what we saw a couple of years ago with American Airlines deciding to exit a certain fleet. You can see things break loose, and our job is to make sure that we are in the right place at the right time to be able to move quickly and capture assets when they become available, even if there's not an overall change in the market. And that's what we're focused on doing. Got it. Got it. it, it just yeah, as we're, we're talking here, I mean, it, what's the – the environment like? Are, are there just very limited assets or are you seeing maybe, you know, uh, airline operators actually looking to buy equipment not to make an ROI on it but just because they need to service their planes? I mean, are you seeing a, a it's, high it's, level it's, of... Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, no, it's predominantly the latter. Um, you know, okay. you are seeing airlines, um, you know, they just need the lift. And so as assets come available... Um, you know, the airlines themselves or lessors are going right after those assets because lease rates are extremely favorable right now because there's, there's tremendous demand because the airlines just need the lift. Got it. Got it. Um, but what this, what the, the, other, the other point to mention there is as those engines are in operation, you're burning off a lot of green time at once, which means that once these, um, you know, as, once these do go in for maintenance, they're going to require a lot of parts. And that, again, is a favorable demand environment for us. Got it. Of course. Sure. Um, 
last one, uh, Sean, just on the uh, the adjustments in the quarter. Any any detail on the uh, the investigation costs that were fourteen cents and the the contract termination costs of nine cents? Any any color you can provide there? Uh, <clears throat> nothing further on the investigation. It's been the same investigation line item uh, for the past number of quarters, and then the uh, contract termination is the expeditionary services pallet contract that I talked about in the in the yep. opening remarks. Yep. Um, so okay, those are the items. Got it. Perfect. Thanks, guys. I'll jump back in the queue. Thank you. Please stand by for our next question. Our next question comes from the line of Ken Herbert with RBC. Your line is open. Yeah, hey, good afternoon, uh, John and Sean. <clears throat> hey, maybe, John, I wanted to first start on the, the, the P8. It sounds like the airframe IDIQ is sort of a, a continuation of work you've been doing, but I just wanted to clarify that there isn't maybe a step up there in terms of the revenue opportunity. But then second, and maybe more importantly, on the engine side, can you talk about how much of that could be incremental from a revenue standpoint this year, how that phases in? And and what exactly are you doing on the engine side? Is it is it more sort of parts support or maybe a little more color there, please? No, yeah, uh, great. Appreciate you asking about those two awards. Um, so yes, for the first one, the Airframe Award, that is a continuation of work that we have today. Um, the volumes of heavy maintenance for that fleet do change over time, um, and there is a chance that uh, we do see uh, uh, more volume out of that contract in this next phase than we saw in the previous phase. We got to wait to secure the award and get the schedule from the uh, the Navy, but um, you know, based on what the the proposal that we submitted, uh, uh, you know, said. It's, uh, it, it's possible you could see a step up in volume there. Um, as it relates to the engine award, that is, that is entirely new business for AAR, and what we will be doing is helping to manage the supply chain and provide parts. We have a partner that will actually be doing the wrench turning. Uh, that will come out uh, once the government uh, uh, you know, releases more information, but we will be working that partner to manage the overall engine flow and then supply parts to that partner in support of the engine overhauls. Uh, can, is it, can you quantify yet maybe how much growth the engine, the part supply part of that contract could provide this year? Once we get uh, full clarity from the government on our position on the contract, uh, we'll be able to, to get more data on that. But we do feel it'll be a, um, uh, a, a nice contributor in terms of revenue and income. Um, and, uh, you know, in terms of when it starts, obviously, you know, we got to see if there's a protest, et cetera. Um, but, uh, uh, you know, we do feel like it, it will be a, a meaningful contrib contributor. Okay, great. And as we look at the part supply business, um, you know, nice margins this quarter, how do we think about the progression there? I mean, is a, is a more meaningful step up really held back until you can see a maybe more pronounced whole asset opportunity within within USM, or is there an opportunity – through, through mix and through efficiencies to continue to sort of drive incrementally higher margins on part supply as we think about the cadence of this year and, into, and even into fiscal 26? Sure. Um, for USM, again, it's, it's somewhat situational and dependent on the availability of material and the price at which we uh, are able to acquire and sell that material. Um, and so that, that moves with the market. Um, what we do see is uh, just continued strength out of our new parts distribution business. The margins there, because of our exclusive distribution model, are, are better than what you would normally see in a, uh, in, a, in, a, in a parts distribution business. And with each new win, we're able to continue to leverage our fixed cost base. So I would say over time, we see the, the, the improvement of margin and parts supply on a steady basis coming from the growth in distribution. And then on, a, I would say, a more situational basis, um, uh, you know, based on the opportunities we see in USM. Okay, helpful. And just finally, uh, you know, coming out of your fiscal fourth quarter, there was some incremental concern around um, capacity growth and some spending by more specifically some of the low-cost airlines. And it sounds like that was predominantly sort of idiosyncratic to a few specific airlines and situations. But can you just comment more from a macro standpoint on, on what you're seeing in terms of airline your airline customers and spending into – sort of the back half here of calendar 24, and then I guess any changes in your, your schedules, backlogs, demand as you think about spending into the first part of um, sort of calendar 25? 
Sure, sure. And again, uh, great question. Um, I'd say uh, uh, you know, for certain customers, certain lower cost carriers, to your point, um, that, uh, that, that, that yes, they have uh, uh, you know, seen some softness. However, they are not major customers of AAR. The, the larger carriers, the long haul carriers, those are the ones that um, uh, are continuing to do very well. And uh, those are the ones that are the largest customers of AAR. So from our major customers, we see continued very strong demand um, signals, and they recognize our value proposition. We have definitely been in a position where um, you know, they have favored our maintenance solutions, our part solutions over that of our competitors, even if, uh, uh, even if there's a, a, a decline in their own volumes. But you know, I would say just broadly, uh, our largest customers are continuing to express um, strong demand throughout uh, the rest of this fiscal year. Great. Thanks, John. Thanks, Ken. Please stand by for our next question. Our next question comes from the line of Louis Di Palmo with William Blair. Your line is open. John and, and Sean, good afternoon. Hey, Louis. How are you doing? Great. Can you talk about the business development and pipeline activity with Trax? And, and when do you expect that Trax can become a, a viable sales channel for your, your parts business? Thanks. Yeah, thanks for asking about Trax. It was a good quarter for Trax. They made a nice uh, contribution to the results um, in a couple of ways. One, they uh, uh, upgraded certain of their existing customers, and they actually were able to capture some, some new customers. Not all of these things were able to announce customer by customer, but uh, they're making really nice progress in the market. One of the main uh, reasons we felt that uh, we should acquire Trax and could bring value to their business was our ability to open doors for them, big doors for them uh, in the market with larger airlines that may not have been comfortable um, uh, turning their ERP system over to a smaller company like Trax. We are seeing that play out. We're very encouraged by the pipeline of acti activity with Trax, particularly with some very large airlines. And uh, we're hopeful that uh, you know, in the coming quarters we'll be able to secure that business, which will validate that important element of the acquisition thesis. So we feel good about that. And then to the second part of your question about you know, Trax as a pipeline for our, our, our part sales, um, that is still something we feel very, very strongly about. In the early you know, year, the first year of the Trax acquisition, our priority has been to um, uh, improve the operations of Trax so that they could scale to ultimately support larger customers. And we made a great deal of progress in that regard. Once we feel good about what we've done then, there, uh, we'll turn our attention to the, uh, the integration between AAR and Trax around, uh, around selling parts. But we're still uh, a little bit away from, from being able to, uh, to get that done. Great. And a few quarters ago, still on tracks, I think you mentioned Singapore Airlines and Archer Aviation as, as new customers. Yeah, right. um, how are those implementations coming? Uh, they're, they're, they're complete. Um, and uh, those customers are up and running and live. Um, there's, uh, there's another significant customer that we hadn't announced publicly that in that same period of time is, is up and running and live. Uh, we upgraded another uh, existing customer to the, the latest and greatest suite of offering from Trax. That implementation went well and is live. So um, again, going back to your prior question, one of the main areas of focus for us is to be able to handle multiple, multiple implementations and upgrades at the same time. That's something that was difficult for Trax to do uh, when they were on their own. Um, and so we've made a lot of progress in being able to, to take on many things at the same time. Great. And following up on Ken's question for the, the Navy, the pair of the Navy P-8 contracts, for the, the engine services contract, did, did you take that contract away from an incumbent? And is that why you think there's an increased likelihood of a protest? Um, uh, I can't say about the incumbent, but we, we and I, I don't know if there will be a protest or not. We we, we don't. Um, uh, so, okay. uh, but to the extent that there were multiple bidders, uh, rather than whether it was an incumbent, um, that's uh, you know that's why we always have our eye open to a, you know a potential uh, potential protest. 
But as you as you know, in the government world, that's just very common. Yes, definitely. And are are there many other types of these engine contracts out there for the different um, the Navy or Air Force platforms that you could either take away from you know the incumbents or just new work in general. I would just, yeah, I would just answer it broadly and say that you know we feel very strongly that our commercial offering should play very well for all uh, commercial derivative um, uh, military aircraft. And so whether it's airframe maintenance or accessory repair um, or component repair or engine support, we think that uh, we're in a position to take what we do really well in the commercial markets and port it to the government markets. Sounds good. And, and one final con question, um, perhaps this is yeah, for both of you, John and Sean. As it relates to Triumph, can you talk about the progress or the plans to like, insource the repair work for USM? Are we still in the, the early innings of, of integrating Triumph such that you can you know, take some of the Triumph repair capabilities and support your USM business? Yeah, um, we have uh, a couple different vectors there. One, in terms of the, the transfer of work from our existing facility in New York to the facilities in Wellington, Kansas, and Dallas, um, we, uh, we're, 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 we're on track there. Um, there's two buckets of work. There's commercial work and there's government work. The commercial work is right on track and the majority has been transferred. The government work takes longer because we have to build capability, get it audited and approved by the government. Once that happens, we can, we can cut the work over. Both of those areas are, are absolutely on track. As it relates to insourcing, really two main buckets of work there. One is to support the USM business, as you just mentioned. Uh, that is largely done. We're, um, uh, you know, we're insourcing all that we can uh, today for the USM business. The longer term uh, element of that is the, uh, the work supporting our commercial programs business. Um, and there, I would say that generally we actually see more opportunity to insource work with a modest amount of investment in Triumph than we did um, uh, when, we, when we agreed to do the deal. So we're very encouraged by the opportunity there. It will take longer because it's not just work that we control, it's ultimately work that we're doing in support of a third party customer that's got to approve everything. But uh, uh, headline there is we see we see more opportunity to insource commercial programs work than we previously thought. Fantastic. Thanks, John and Sean. Thanks, Lee. Thank you. Please stand by for our next question. We have a follow up question from the line of Scott Micus with Melius Research. Your line is open. Uh, yes, yeah, so I just have a quick one for Sean. Sean, do you have the growth rates for defense and commercial within just the new parts distribution business? Uh, not at my fingertips. Um, yeah, just, just for this quarter, or you mean over the past several quarters? I mean, you, just for this quarter if you have it. If not, we can follow up offline. Yeah, I'll follow up. And then the queue will be filed later, which will have uh, some of that information, so we can follow up after that. Okay, perfect. Thank you. Thank you. Please stand by for our next question. We have a follow-up question from the line of Kim Herbert with RBC. Your line is open. Yeah, hey, thanks. Hey, maybe, Sean, just another quick follow-up. Last year, you you know had a similar sort of cash burn in the first quarter, but then you were nicely positive uh, in terms of cash operations and free cash through the rest of the year. Do you expect a similar sort of cadence now starting in the second quarter of this fiscal year in terms of cash generation? And I guess bigger picture, how should we think about full year free cash generation, maybe just sort of relative to, to EBITDA or maybe how much of an improvement should we expect relative to fiscal 24? Yeah, um, so I would expect a similar cadence uh, from Q1 for the balance of the year in terms of cash flow generation, um, just some seasonality with, with Q1 and timing of cash flows. Um, and then as it relates to the balance of the fiscal year, um, I would expect that inventory will be a net user of, uh, of, of capital, of cash, 
um, as we continue to grow uh, the part supply businesses specifically. Um, in terms of AR, I think from a DSO standpoint, we keep that pretty consistent, and you can use that on your sales growth assumptions. Um, CapEx run rate for this quarter is uh, probably a good number to use, and then interest expense. Yeah, you know, we mentioned on the call uh, or in my opening remarks that interest expense would be similar uh, to Q1. Uh, and then when you think about the back half of the year, that should come down both with a little bit of rate relief on the revolver uh, as well as uh, reduction in net debt on the on the average borrowers. Okay, so so full full year free cash up over last year, but but maybe um, maybe similar to maybe sort of the 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 growth, it sounds like working capital is going to continue to be a, a tail or a headwind in terms of free cash generation this year as well. Yeah, up over last year with net working capital still being a net consumer of cash, but overall cash a little higher than last year. Perfect. Thanks, Sean. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, at this time, I would like to turn the call back over to management for closing remarks. Great. Thank you very much. We really appreciate all the uh, the time and the interest and the support, and we look forward to uh, being back here in, uh, uh, in January to talk about Q2. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, this concludes today's conference call. Thank you for your participation. You may now disconnect.